It's my fourth complication talk this meeting. The good news is that the other three were all hernias. My real passion is making complications endoscopically. So let's talk about that. Right, so, so anytime somebody offers you a talk called the peg is going through what? Like you just say, yes, we're gonna give that talk. So these are my disclosures, which really don't have uh, much relevance to what we're gonna talk about today. So I've got really three goals here for the day today. We're gonna talk about PEG-related complications, primarily focusing on the PEG traversing important things, that being visceral and vascular injuries. Uh, we'll talk about some risk factors for those and methods to avoid those complications. And then we'll talk a little bit about how to manage these things. And, and we're gonna focus a little more on the endoscopic management of them, but we'll obviously put this in the context of we're surgeons, we'll follow surgical algorithms uh, as well. So. These procedures have been around for a long time. Uh, this is the most common method of obtaining durable enteral access, and we know that in the overwhelming majority of patients, even complex patients, these are safe and cost efficient, and they have a very high success rate. Um, they're placed about 200,000 times a year in the U.S., and this is very old and probably underestimated data. But we know that our U.S. population is aging. We know that people are living longer with chronic medical conditions and that we're utilizing more medical therapy in the later years of life. And so I think that the anticipation is that the use of gastrostomy tubes, in particular pegs, is going to go up over the course of time. And the thing that I tell my residents is that nobody ever says, hey, great job putting that peg tube in. Nobody says, hey, nice peg, right? If it goes fine, it's supposed to go fine. But when it goes poorly, everybody says, how come your peg didn't go so well? And so these are patients that, that, these are pegs that I've put in. So the patient on the left developed a necrotizing infection. You could put your entire fist down into her abdominal wall by the time she came back to us to have this complication managed. The patient on the right-hand side, you'll notice no longer has a gastrostomy in place because she leaked, she had part of her stomach resected. I took off 75% of her left abdominal wall muscles for a necrotizing infection. She's actually still in the hospital now, and oh, by the way, she actually has a fistula at the bottom now as a result of the open abdomen. So problems with these procedures happen. And again, these were just leaking patients. These are not traversing other organs. So the complication rate for these uh, varies over the course of, uh, depending on what study you look at. Um, they vary with population, they vary with the technique that you put them in. And, and again, I think one of the problems is, you know, the large series on these are generally reported by people who do a lot of them. And so there's probably an under-reporting of complications. And then the question is, well, like, what is a complication, right? Like, is a little bit of redness around a peg a complication? Well, I don't know, it probably is a low-grade infection. We treat it, but those are obviously major complications versus minor complications. And so when you break these things down, you get a list of this is what we think is a minor complication, this is a major complication. And we're gonna focus today now on hemorrhage, hollow viscous injury and bleeding in the liver and uh, stomach. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of it. Big risk factors for all these problems include the following age greater than 65. Well, I just told you the population is aging. BMI 30, well, we all know the population is enlarging. Uh, and neurologic disorders. And there are probably some other complications that, that uh, go along with this. And uh, Dr. McGee showed, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Lipinska showed uh, endoscopy inexperience being a problem related to perforations. The same thing happens here. If you are an inexperienced endoscopist, you're more likely to have problems with these procedures. But there is some other stuff, okay, that you can simply look at a patient and say, like, look, this is a bad idea to try and put a peg in, right? Like, let's look at the scan and I'll just agree that we shouldn't try it. I'm gonna show you what happens when you try on this person in a little bit, okay? Stay tuned. Um, this is a patient who has an overlying medical device. So, <clears throat> liver, ascites, driveline for LVAD, colon, costal margin, gastric window. Can you peg this patient? I mean, maybe, okay, but if it's like your 30th peg, maybe don't make this your 30th peg. Maybe think about some other method of enteral access for this patient. How about this patient? This patient is a ICU patient. They just had a brand new VP shunt put in, and you say, hey, well, you know, look, they've got some cardiac monitors, a little pleural effusion. There's a feeding tube in here. The stomach looks okay, but where's that VP shunt? Well, that's the VP shunt, all right? And again, I think if you're gonna do it and you don't want your peg to traverse the shunt, you need to have an understanding of where it is and figure out how to avoid it, okay? How about these folks? That spleen is not gonna let you put a peg tube in, okay? The patient has dysphagia, by the way, because they have a massive spleen, and if you fix that, that'll actually fix the problem, but I digress. You know, and then, and again, thinking about patients who have abdominal wall varices, okay? These are patients who are not candidates for peg tubes, and all people we've been asked to sort of look at and think about, can you get a peg in this patient, or do we actually have to operate? The answer is no, by the way. <laughs> 
uh, small bowel distension or large bowel distension. So uh, this is actually a massive colon distension here. Here's, here's, the, here's the stomach back here, large air fluid levels. And again, I'm not saying these folks are unpeggable, but what I am saying is when you meet this person, you've got to think about should we do it. I rarely use a CT scan or an image to say I absolutely can't do it, but what I do use it to say is I need some additional adjuncts in the operating room, uh, and we may have a high chance of sort of backing out from this one, so everybody be prepared for us to come back without a gastrostomy tube in place. How about this person who's got, ignore the liver, which is full of Mets. Let's look at the small bowel distension here. We've got a stomach that's medially displaced and up under the costal margin. We've got a left lateral segment of the liver in the way. And again, I'm not saying you can't do this, but what I am saying is you need to simply be aware that the fixed organs, the dilated organs, and the distal small bowel obstruction, which is, by the way, the reason the peg is going in in this patient, are going to make this a challenging gastrostomy placement. Here's a patient who's got an NG tube put in for a large hiatal hernia. So the NG tube is mostly above the diaphragm. But if you look at the bowel gas pattern, here's the colon coming up. And in that left upper quadrant, the colon kind of overlies it before it comes down. Again, this person might be peggable, but you have to realize that that colon is not in a normal anatomic position and recognize that there's a potential problem. And I'll show you what happens in this person in a little bit. Um, this is, I, I put a lot of gastrostomy tubes in for ALS patients, and in ALS patients, they come to you and never had surgery before, you don't expect any altered anatomy, but one of the things you'll notice, this is my interventional radiology colleagues looking for a place to do a percutaneous gastrostomy tube because of severe pulmonary dysfunction. These, uh, these diaphragms are both uh, severely elevated, which means the entire body, the stomach, is above the costal margin, so this marker right here is showing this is the edge of the costal margin where we want to put the gastrostomy. Here's a stomach that's been inflated with an NG tube, and here's a bunch of bowel gas that's in the way. So the stomach is elevated. This person is not a candidate for a gastrostomy placed radiographically. Now, with a, gastro with a, a gastroscope in, you might be able to push that stomach down, but again, you may not, so be aware of that. So how do we avoid injury? Well, um, for safe pl peg placement, for me, the number one thing is just, like, be suspicious. I'm a cautious cat, and I, I'm, I think everybody's out to get me. Um, my therapist says that's a problem, but, but peg patients, for sure, I'm much more nervous about. Utilize a safe track technique. This is, this is like number one, number two, and number three thing to avoid injury. So how do we do it? Number one, we start by transilluminating, and we want to see clear transillumination at the body of the stomach. Um, but there are some problems. Sometimes when you transilluminate, the point of maximal transillumination is not where you want to be, right? Like, you definitely don't want to put the peg in the right lower quadrant, even though that's where the stomach is located in this patient. So, like, don't just take what it gives you. Like, this person is entirely transilluminated, and I would suggest not putting the peg tube in the transverse colon, which is actually what you can actually see the hostile folds here. Don't, like, don't do that either, okay? So, clear transillumination does not mean you have a safe track yet. We're then going to do good one-to-one -one finger palpation to say that we've got adequate one-to-one -one motion. And then we're going to pass a small finder needle through the abdominal wall, aspirating as we go. And as soon as you see the needle in the body of the stomach, you should get air. If you see air before you've reached the stomach, you are in some other viscous. What do you do? You take the needle out and you look for a new location. If you have blood in the needle, you have hit something that has blood within it. I would not put the peg tube in that location. Uh, you pass your wire, you pass your snare, and then you do the rest of the peg however you want to do it. So what are some adjuncts? So I showed you a lot of people with complex anatomy. How do we keep things safe? Well, okay, this is a person who has a VP shunt in place, and here's the VP shunt. So on those people, especially when it's a brand new shunt, and I, I know that they put it somewhere in the midline, not off to the sides, uh, I use fluoroscopy, and here's my stomach, here's my endoscope, here's where I'm going to put the gastrostomy tube just under the costal margin. I'm remote from that VP shunt. I'm not going to go through it and fracture it. Again, here's, an, here's that patient I showed you earlier who's got some colon distension. So here's a colon over the stomach. This is a person who was looked at by our radiologists, and they said, we cannot or should not try to put a gastrostomy in. And I said, I can try. So here's the stomach maximally inflated. Here's the colon and the small bowel down below. And here's our fluoroscopic marker of where we're going to put the tube. This is now safe radiographically. We have good one-to-one -one motion. We have good transillumination. We have a safe track. We put the gastrostomy tube in. Here's a patient who I could not find a safe track. There was simply none. This patient has cancer. The omentum overlying it was fixed. So I asked my radiologists to get a needle track down through the omentum where I couldn't see a safe track through. 
and simply leave a wire in the stomach, and then I can rendezvous with that wire, and we can perform a gastrostomy over the wire. So cross-sectional imaging can certainly be used. Here's that other patient that I showed you with massive colon distension. It was really, really quite distended. But interestingly enough, if you look at her scan, this is actually her stomach. The problem was when we tried to transilluminate, everything transilluminated. So what did we do? Well, my endoscope actually travels. And so I went down to interventional radiology. This is Ricky Mirage, one of my really good interventional radiologists. If you ever wondered what an endoscope looks like on CAT scan, that's what it looks like. We put a marker, we put a gastrostomy tube in, Bob's your uncle, okay? So you can be creative with these to avoid doing surgery in patients when you want to. Here's another patient with massive colonic distension. This is where we're thinking about putting our gastrostomy, but this, this is the colon. And so you'll see there's a second scope here. We've actually got a colonoscope in to decompress. That's the colonoscope and the endoscope kind of, you know, kissing in the middle there. The colon is now decompressed, and now we've got an adequate window once we insufflate the stomach again to say, hey, look, the colon's out of the way, uh, the, the stomach is now insufflated, and we can place a gastrostomy here. And oh, by the way, if we have any doubt, once we get the wire in place, before we dilate that tract, you can actually do a complete colonoscopy forward and back past the area where you might have injured the colon and make sure you don't see the wire traversing the colon. And here's what that looks like when you do side-by-side -side endoscopy. You've got a wire in the stomach, you've got no wire in the colon, and we all feel pretty good that we haven't traversed the colon here. Um, but what happens when you do have injury? Well, first off, uh, as we heard in the other lectures, patients with hard surgical signs uh, get an operation, okay? We're surgeons, we all know that. So the stuff that I'm gonna say now all comes with that caveat, okay? So number one, vascular injury should be really, really, really uncommon. The most common thing that we injure are really branches of the epigastric vessels or the intercostal vessels, which are you know somewhere in the body of the left rectus muscle, which is where most of these goes. And usually you get a hematoma. It's the typical presentation. Occasionally, more rarely, gastric or omental vessels are hit. And these typically present with more severe bleeding that's early intragastric bleeding. But again, the bleeding can really be anywhere. You can get intragastric bleeding, intra-abdominal, preperitoneal, posterior rectus sheath, intramuscular, any plane between where that tube is located that's been traversed with it can have bleeding in it. And I've seen pretty much all of them. The problem is when you see bleeding in one of the planes, you don't know where it's coming from, you don't know what, and you don't know how to stop it, and so you've gotta be suspicious that it's something more severe. Having said that, most of them are really just from gastric, uh, small gastric uh, submucosal vessels, uh, like this patient who actually had an entire you know, bo stomach body full of blood with a little bit of active bleeding, but it's a tiny little submucosal vessel which is easily manageable endoscopically. You get in, you see a bunch of blood clot, you wash it out, you let the gastrostomy down, you inject or clip around it, and you're done. Uh, but sometimes you get bits of omentum that are in between, and you get some bleeding from that. This is actually a retromuscular bleed. You can actually see there's actually blood in the body of the rectus muscle here uh, from a small branch vessel that was sort of damaged. Uh, the easiest thing to do when there is bleeding is to simply put a little bit of upward pressure on the bleeding, and that gives you a direct tamponade effect across the tract. Now, the downside is that will solve many instances of, of uh, low-grade bleeding. You do have to be suspicious that it may not stop. And remember, the tension on a peg tube is your enemy. It'll lead to those bad problems that I showed you in my very first slide. So leaving the tension there for long is not a good idea. Um, you want to make sure that you uh, are addressing as well whether there's ongoing bleeding and expanding hematoma. Uh, as we saw earlier with bleeding from the colon, you can go with angioembolization for gastric or gastroepiploic arteries if, if it's possible. And again, operative exploration uh, if all else fails. What about solid viscous injuries? Again, these should be really, really uncommon. I'll point your attention to this peg tube going through the left lateral segment of the liver, which is kind of surprising because there's this whole area over here where you have expected a really safe tract to have been identified. But the good news is there's a little bit of fluid around this tract, but there's no active bleeding, all right? This patient had pain, which was the indication for the CT scan. So this is really an incidental finding. Although if you want, wonder how incidental, there is a little bit of free fluid over this. This, was, this patient was managed conservatively. Uh, here's a patient who had a gastrostomy to put in. This is not the best CT scan, but it's one of the few that's actually out there in the literature. You're seeing a peg tube that's actually going through the left lateral segment. It's no longer in the stomach, and this thing right here is a very large intra-abdominal hematoma, and that patient required a laparotomy and actually a left lateral segment resection.
So what do we do for solid viscous injuries? Again, this is like penetrating trauma to an organ. And uh, in, in all honesty, operative exploration is probably the right, ex the right answer for most of them. However, in a stable patient or a patient who has really minor symptoms, and these are incidentally noted, a contrast-enhanced CT scan to rule out uh, uh, early bleeding. Uh, if there's no bleeding, they can, in, they can actually be managed conservatively. And because these uh, are accessible with interventional radiology means angioembolization can be utilized for these. Now, more commonly is a hollow viscous injury, roughly 1.3%. Colon, small bowel are all both really well reported. And obviously, colon injury is the most common thing because the transverse colon overlies uh, the stomach and the epigastrum. And so if you're not inflating uh, uh, sig you know, significantly, your stomach, the colon is still going to be at play. The sigmoid colon in some patients, if it's large or redundant, can loop upward, and it can get in your way as well. Uh, these injuries, though, are really preventable, uh, again, with some, some caution ahead of time. Um, and again, uh, acute issues uh, and problems uh, afterwards warrant uh, operative exploration. So this is what a delayed hollow viscous injury looks like. This patient had a gastrostomy. It worked well. They went home. The tube was exchanged. They came back because they were having diarrhea. And what you see is you've got a gastrostomy tube, which is now exclusively in the colon following the replacement, and a stomach that's behind it, and really nothing else. There's no leak. There's really no problem here. The biggest issue is this patient needs a gastrostomy, and what they have is a colostomy tube, and they're not getting as much nutrition as you would expect uh, feeding the, the mid-transverse colon. Uh, this patient, when the peg tube was put in, and someone did try to put a peg tube in this patient, has a peg that when you inject contrast goes directly into the sigmoid colon. And again, that works less well than you would expect. However, this was a delayed finding, okay? It went through and through the colon. The patient did well. It was only after the tube was changed when it was dislodged that, that the problem became apparent. And so the patient now needs a gastrostomy tube put in later on. Uh, sometimes you're doing a colonoscopy, and you come across this, okay? This is a patient who had a gastrostomy tube put in. Uh, it uh, was exchanged, and uh, this is what it looks like colonoscopically. Uh, this patient incidentally needed a gastrostomy, and it becomes a problem when you need to put it back in. Uh, here's what a, a small bowel injury looks like. This patient had a peg tube that was placed low. It went through the small bowel mesentery, which was fixed on an adhesive band. It was under a lot of tension. You can actually see the tension on this, the downward tension. It eventually eroded through the bowel, causing a leak, which was managed in a delayed fashion. So that's a problem. So how do you manage this? Well, the first question is, does this person need a peg tube? If they don't, you can generally just take it out, and it's not a big deal. But if they still need it, or if they have fistulas, I usually take those down endoscopically. So here we're closing a persistent gastrocolic fistula. Uh, we then use fluoroscopy to say, hey, how are we going to get a gastrostomy tube back in this person? Because the colon is now fixed in place because there's a peg track there. And so we're using fluoro to find a new location uh, to place a gastrostomy tube. Again, these can certainly be taken down surgically or laparoscopically. Uh, you don't have to do all this endoscopic stuff that we do. But again, we're trying to avoid reoperating on people who we didn't want to operate on uh, to begin. Uh, this is a person who had a gastrostomy tube uh, placed uh, to decompress. Uh, can you play the video for me, please? My mouse is not working. Uh, a gastrostomy tube here was placed to uh, uh, decompress a large parasophageal hernia. Uh, the tubes were removed over the course of time, and this patient actually presented uh, with one of the tubes in her colon. The other tube is completely out, and a small bowel volvulus uh, around the peg tract. Okay, so the, present, the presentation here was the bowel obstruction, not the peg tube and the colon, and uh, this was managed uh, surgically as you see here. Again, if the patient needs a peg tube put back in, you can simply put a gastrostomy tube back in when you're in the OR laparoscopically. So I'll conclude by saying that peg injuries certainly do happen. These direct puncture injuries are, are pretty common, but they're also underreported. Uh, vessel injuries should be much, much less common, but uh, these things are all at risk. You need to be aware of who's high risk, use a safe track at all costs, use real-time imaging if you need to, and again, conservative management can be tried. Uh, if you have endoscopic abilities, you can do it, uh, but don't avoid doing a necessary surgery on these patients. Uh, thank you very much.